Hi everybody. In this video, we're going to cover the linear dependence lemma, do a self-explanation of it. This was an assignment in class, and there were several mistakes that hopefully we can rectify here. So let's jump in by looking at the statement of the theorem. We start with the assumption, right, if v1 through vm is a linearly dependent list in v. Right, so we can start with a linearly dependent list instead of a linearly independent list. It's saying there exists a j between 1 and m. So now we have to distinguish here between the numbers which are indexing the vectors, v1 through vm, and the vectors themselves. So when they say there exists a j, they're not saying there exists a vector. They're saying there exists the number, and it happens to correspond to a vector. All right, so there is some number which corresponds to a vector, such that if you take that corresponding vector, called vj, then it's in the span of the vectors v1 through vj minus 1. If you like, these are the previous vectors in the list. Moreover, if the jth term is removed from the original list, that's vj is removed, then the span of the remaining list equals the span of the original list. All right, so that's the linear dependence lemma. So as you can rem there's some vector which you can write as a linear combination of previous vectors. And if you remove that vector, you're not going to change the span of the list. All right, so let's jump into line one. It says, because the list v1 through vm is linearly dependent, there exist numbers, a1 through am and f, not all zero, such that the, there's a linear combination of the vi's which equals zero. All right, so a lot of people say, well, this is just the definition of linear dependence, and that's, that's almost true. Uh, what's more correct is that um, since v1 through vm is linearly independent or dependent, we will get and make this a little easier to write on. There must exist an element in V with more. than one representation, right, in terms of uh, the original list. So we might have gone up here and, and said, well, uh, let's give a name to this original list. Maybe we'll call that L. And so then we could have said this is an L representation. Right? So there are more than one L representation. Now, knowing that you have more than one L representation, we proved is equivalent to saying that zero has more than one L representation. So instead of just saying there is some element, we actually know it can be the zero. So this implies zero has more than one L representation. And that's where we're getting this line up above, saying that we can find we can find scalars such that we get a linear combination equaling zero. All right? This here's your L representation. So we're going to take a1 through a m and f. such that the sum i goes from 1 to m a i v i is an L representation of 0. All right. And our goal, remember the, the very first goal in this proof is to find an element vj which is in the span of the previous ones. So our hope is that we can rearrange this uh, so that we get uh, some vj 
is equal to a linear combination. All right, so let's go to the next line. Now, many people, when they wrote this up, combined lines 2 and lines 3 together. But both of them have something to talk about, so we're going to separate them. All right, so line 2 says, let j be the largest element of the set 1 through m such that aj is not equal to 0. So the first thing is that a lot of people read it like in the following way. They said, let j be the largest element of the set 1 through m. And they stop right there. It's as if they put a, a nice line right here. And, uh, and then many people even said, oh, well, the largest element, that's clearly m. Well, yes, the largest element is clearly m, but there's an extra condition. Yes? The extra condition, and in fact, I use this vertical bar here because when we use set builder notation, what comes after the bar is the such that. And, and that's what we're missing here is the such that. So we're only looking at j's such that a sub j is not equal to 0. So if we go back to the previous line, we know that we have some L representation of 0. And the a sub i's, right, coming from f, those are the, the coefficients in our linear combination. Yeah. All right. Well, we can write all of those coefficients down. And some of them are going to be 0, and some of them are not going to be 0. Well, how do we know at least one of them is non-zero? Well, because up here, and well, I guess we could have said this, uh, we take a1 through a, m, and f, not all zero. Hmm. So we know that some of them are non-zero. Okay, well, of all the ones that are non-zero, one of them is going to occur latest in the linear combination. When I say latest, I mean it's going to have the largest index. So since a1 through am has at least one non-zero entry, right, and that's coming from L1, Note that we, we refer back to previous lines. There must exist a largest index, j, such that aj is not equal to 0. Yep, so it's the index that we're, we're interested in. And that's the, the j we're going to choose. All right, so we know it must exist. So now moving on, say then vj can be written as a linear combination of the previous ones, thus proving a. Okay, so let's see why that is. Well, remember in, in line two, we chose j to be the largest element of the set such that aj was not equal to 0. That means that if you look at aj plus 1, it must equal 0. And aj plus 2 must equal 0, all the way up through am. So by L2, aj plus 1 is equal to aj plus 2 equals dot 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 is equal to am equals 0 because j was the largest index such that aj was not 0. Okay. That means that we can rewrite this linear combination from SE1 with fewer terms in it. So thus, 0 can be written as a linear combination AIVI, where i, instead of running from 1 to m, it runs from 1 to j. And once we know that, we can solve for aj, vj. All right, we just break this sum up. So this implies that aj, vj is equal to the negative of the sum i goes from 1. Well, now we go j minus 1 because we've gotten rid of the vj term. And we have ai, vi. Okay, now I don't want to just have aj, vj. I want to have vj. And I can do that if I divide by aj, but why is that allowed? Well, 
Recall, again in L2, we chose j such that aj is not 0. So, again by L2, aj is not equal to 0, which means we can divide by it. And so vj is going to equal the negative, the sum, i goes from 1 to j minus 1, and now we'll get ai over aj times vj. And this is definitely, oh, vi. And this is in the span of v1 through vj minus 1, which is what we wanted to prove. This proves A. All right, that's the first part. The second part, B, says that once you find this Vj, which is in the span of the previous vectors, you should be able to remove it and not change the span of the remaining list. All right, so it says to prove B, suppose U is in the span of v1 through vm. Well, why are we supposing that? Well, we need to show that everything in the span of v1 through vm removing vj is also in the span, or rather anything in the span of the original list L is also in the span of the list where we remove vj. So we want to show that every element of the span of L, which remember is our V1 through Vm, is in the span of, and this is kind of the notation we had in class, we write Lj hat, meaning we remove the jth term, V1 through Vj minus 1, Vj plus 1, through Vm. So we choose an arbitrary element U in the span of L. We will show that u is in the span of lj hat. All right, so that's, that's going to be our goal. So line 5, then there exist numbers c1 through cm and f such that u is a linear combination of the vi's. So this is just coming from the definition of span. So in L4, we assumed that u is in the span of L. This implies that u has an L representation. we call the coefficients C1 through Cm. Okay. All right, finally it says in the equation above, right, and the equation, right, is this uh, U equals this linear combination of the vi's. In the equation above, above, we can replace vj with the right side of 222. So let's jump up. What was 222? Ah, yes. So 222 was our way of rewriting vj in the span of the previous uh, vectors in the list. Okay. So we can replace vj with the right side of 222. So here's how we'll do that. 
So we have u equals c1 v1 plus okay, c m v m, but we can break this up around v j. So in fact, we'll we'll pull the v j part out. So this is going to equal c j v j. Pull that in the front. Plus, then we have a sum. I goes from 1 to m, where i is not equal to j, and we have ci vi. And now using the right side of 222, I can rewrite this linear combination. I have cj, and then the vj becomes, well, we, we just copy this. And in fact, we can write it nicely uh, as a uh, with summation notation. So we'll get a sum where uh, i goes from 1 to j minus 1. And we have negative a i over a j v i. So they all have replaced the v j term. So there's our vj, and then I have to copy the rest of it. So plus, again, we have some i goes from 1 to m, where i is not equal to j, ci, vi. And what's important here is to note that I have, ultimately, a linear combination of the list lj hat. So there's no longer any vj to be written. All we have, all right, in the first one, the vi's are written down with coefficients, and the i's go from 1 to j minus 1, so there's no j's. And in the second one, you have vi's where i ranges from 1 to m, but i is not allowed to be j. So this is an element in the span of the list where you remove the jth term. Thus behold, well, remember our goal was to take an element in the span of L and show that it was in the span of Lj hat. So since um, uh, every element of span of L is contained in the span of LJ hat, we have span of L is contained in the span of LJ hat. Okay, but now on the other hand, since lj hat is a subset of L, we have that the span of lj hat is contained in the span of L. So if we combine these two statements, right, we have two sets, each of which is contained in the other. Okay. Combining we see that the span of Lj hat is equal to the span of L. And this proves B. Okay, so notice I'm being very, very explicit with why I get the conclusion, right? I'm not just saying thus B holds, I'm saying why it holds. Why does it hold? Because we just showed that one set is contained in the other, and then the one set is contained back in the original, right? Which means that the sets are equal. All right. Hope this helps. Let me know if uh, you have more questions.